Great. So um, in terms of the dynamic of today's webinar, we will start with Brian, the leader of the CDIR platform for Big Data and Agriculture, and he will give us a small introduction of the webinar, and then we will launch right straight with Heido, who is a senior researcher at the research group in spatial economics at AFB University. And to finalize today's webinar, we will have a question and answers session. So I will pass the ball right to you, Brian. Great, thank you, Maria Camila, and thanks everybody for joining. Um, just very briefly, um, so a, a bit about a bit of a note about how we we got here. You know, I think um, uh, all of us, um, you know, that are working on on digital agriculture uh, over the last several years, we've seen, um, you know. A number of kind of you know uh, publications or things in the business press um, indicating that proximal sensor technologies are going to be transforming you know the future of agriculture and um, you know and so we we'll hear things about you know lowering costs and greater availability of the sensor technologies um, and then we uh, you know periodically we come across some really cool bits of analysis where. Uh, ground sensor sensing technologies of various types and remote sensing and and research data converge into something very um, very exciting in terms of a sort of you know agile adaptation and and unlocking new types of analysis and insights um, into agriculture and so while all of that potential is there and I think we agree it's there um, I we've also seen in the last couple of years um, a bit of a bottleneck I think and that is that um, you know, there are an array of sensor providers out there. Um, there are an array of proprietary platforms that may or may not be suitable uh, for agricultural research, and um, and then an array of you know just kind of project or or, or operational contexts in which um, these technologies will be used. And so you know, when we look at um, uh, research institutions uh, such as ourselves in the CGIAR network, um, there's just a number of kind of bottlenecks that we need to resolve. I mean, so for example, um, uh, you know, it's not really clear, for example, what needs to be measured at what frequency and what variables and over what area um, in any kind of unifying way that we can start talking about Internet of Things sensors for uh, agronomic use cases. Similarly, for, um, for, for breeding um, use cases and breeding trials, we've not really, we haven't really seen anywhere where there's a really converged view on um, what needs to be measured with what frequency over what area to be relevant for, um, for, for breeding decision making. Um, what once those data are being you know generated, once those measurements are are, are happening, um, what's the right sort of architecture in terms of where that data needs to flow to then be useful um, for for ongoing analysis and feeding into the kinds of research um, efforts that 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 we develop? Um, how do we um, try to start to define a more unifying architecture vision um, for IoT data? remote sensing data, uh, data that we have in databases related to say field trials or, or, or what have you. So these are the kinds of questions where a number of providers out there that would certainly help us to, to work through that. Um, but so many of those providers also are, are offering you know, services. They're providers of services and technologies. And so what we decided that what, what we really needed to do with the big data platform was to start to sort of start from scratch, start gathering requirements from, from um, uh, breeders and from agronomists, um, pick a context or a couple of contexts where we could start putting some bounds around the problem and then go through a design exercise where we look at this whole array of um, technology choices uh, down from what's measured on what frequency and over what area to how is that data going to be transmitted, how does that, that data then get into some kind of data portal, and then a bit about also about how is that data going to be interoperable with other types of data. And so um, we, uh, we started uh, this question with uh, the, uh, a really interesting um, and capable network of, of, of researchers in Colombia that was the 
um, uh, Center of Excellence for Internet of Things. And, um, and then Jairo Gomez um, had since moved on from uh, his role there, but um, we were lucky enough to get some of his time to help us look at this, you know, kind of bottom up design um, set of questions that I've just mentioned. So, um, so over to you, Jairo, and, uh, and really good to have you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brian, for the introduction, for the invite. Uh, so today's, today's uh, webinar is entitled Design Process of an IoT Architecture for Agriculture at Alliance with Biodiversity International and CIET. Um, the agenda has three main points. Uh, I would like to discuss the context, basically the needs, users, and IoT requirements, the design approach, and basically the discussion. Uh, what we did, what we learned, and what could be next. In terms of the need, uh, we had four main points. Uh, we want to acquire near real-time sensor data from selected crops and environmental variables. We want to be able to transmit that data to the processing infrastructure, either a gateway, a data center, or cloud infrastructure through the IoT network. We would like to be able to fuse and analyze data from multiple sources, including field sensors, drones, satellite imagery, and external web services. And uh, we would like also to feed the analytics uh, back into a decision support system and control system to act upon the crops. Uh, in terms of users, we had two main users in mind, the high throughput uh, phenotyping team and the data-driven agronomy team. So the block diagram that you're seeing uh, the, on the, at the bottom of the, the uh, slide includes like an, a general overview of, of what we're dealing with. So we have a, a bunch of crops and we want to uh, perform some measurements on that through sensors. And then those measurements have to navigate through the IoT network. Sometimes they can go directly through the uh, on-premise infrastructure, but sometimes those measurements might be able to, to go through the cloud first and then to the uh, infrastructure as such. Then once you have some um, meaningful insights, you might be able to fit some uh, control actions back into the field through the IoT network and then through the uh, final actuators to modify some variables. So this is like the general overview of uh, what we're dealing with. Uh, so when we started with this uh, program, we had a couple of meetings with uh, people from uh, CIET, uh, from the, those two themes that I mentioned before. And uh, we had these um, kind of constraints that um, uh, Brian mentioned before, about how to uh, start uh, with something for the design. So we had in mind that there are two terrains to monitor. Uh, each uh, terrain has 50 meters by 13 meters. Uh, the crops of interest will include uh, rice, maize, cassava, and bean. Um, I asked about the crop height because that's very important for wireless communications. And uh, they say those crops can range from anything between one meter to five meters. Uh, the maximum range for the wireless link is about four kilometers. That's, this is very sea uh, specific uh, because of the uh, topology of the campus. And uh, they also mentioned that it was more important to have uh, monitoring than control, but obviously, you know, we would like to keep as much as possible a two-way communication channel. Uh, again, real-time communication is not a priority, so as long as we have something uh, about near real-time, it's okay. Um, in terms of the scenarios that we should consider for the wireless availability, uh, they mentioned that we should handle three possible scenarios, none, medium, and full wireless availability. Uh, we should make sure that uh, any deployment wouldn't interfere with existing RF links, particularly for drones. Um, also, uh, it was very important from the very beginning to make sure that whatever architecture we came up with will be able to scale up as more nodes uh, were included. And uh, we should also be able to uh, fuse uh, imagery from drones or from satellite, uh, different scales. So um, finally, uh, even though the internet connectivity is not essential, we recognize that uh, also at some point in the future, this will be a component. So it was like a, a, an optional thing to, to, to include there. Okay, so um, during those meetings, one of the first thing I asked was about, okay, what sort of traits do you want to measure? Uh, how often do you want to measure those traits? and uh, with what spatial resolution do you want to measure those traits? So um, Michael Silbaraj helped us with uh, this table from his team. And uh, it's, this table is clustered in two sections. So you have above ground sensors and below ground sensors. 
For above ground sensors, they basically need one per crop or one per field. So you can see that the spatial requirement is, is, is pretty easy to accomplish. And uh, also the temporal sampling is not that demanding. You know, they only need to sample those, these variables here about uh, each, uh, every 30 minutes or so. Now for below ground sensors, um, the temporal requirement uh, is even nicer. You know, they only need to sample these things about uh, three times a day or about eight hours, but the spatial resolution is pretty tough. You know, they need to measure these variables at about uh, three meters. So as I'm going to show later, this uh, requirement is going to impose some serious constraints in the overall uh, dimension of the IoT solution and obviously yeah, in the costing. Okay, so what was the design approach that we took uh, for this process? Now we had basically five steps. The first step was uh, doing a review of IoT architectures in three domains. The first domain was technology leaders. The second domain was uh, having a look at what other uh, open source initiatives were doing in this field, and then having a look obviously at what research groups are doing uh, around. Then uh, once we had this review, uh, we tried to identify common elements, trends, and transferable components that could be, you know, reused, and also try to identify the gaps and the missing blocks, particularly for agriculture, because some of the, the existing literature is very focused on business, uh, different than agriculture. With that information, we proposed a reference architecture uh, that could be integrated, uh, or at least we did it with that idea that could be integrated into a larger fan CGIR uh, information architecture. Um, once we had that reference architecture, uh, we moved on looking for open source software projects and hardware components that could enable uh, such uh, development for an IoT pilot. And the final step was about trying to put some quantities and uh, prices of basically doing the costing for the, for, for, for the project. Okay, so let's just start with some of the alternatives that we found um, from the technology leaders. So this is an architecture from Intel. Um, it's a layer architecture, a hierarchical one. Uh, it has uh, different components. So one is in, very intended for developers, which is the transversal layer that you see at the very left. Uh, then we have a security layer, which is transversal to, to all other layers. And then it starts from bottom to top with a communications and connectivity layer. Then it has a data layer and anal analytics management, control, and then you have application and business layers. Uh, the interesting thing about Intel's architecture is that it somehow uh, incorporates or understands that the IoT problem has two components, hardware and software. So they consider uh, those devices that, are, that have native connectivity and those who uh, don't have such connectivity. Uh, for the devices that don't have internet connectivity natively, uh, they propose to route that information through a bunch of gateways and then processing uh, the data in the cloud using services such as storage, uh, batch processing, uh, and, uh, and visualization, basically. So you see, you're going to see uh, three elements uh, over this uh, presentation. Things, which are basically those uh, end nodes uh, or sensors that we want to connect, the network, and then some kind of processing uh, at the very right. Uh, when we went and, and, and looked for the solution at Microsoft, uh, we found this architecture. So uh, we can recognize some uh, common elements. The main idea is that they have, they recognize that there are some IoT devices that send information through a hub, an IoT hub basically, and that information is routed through a stream uh, processing that basically sends uh, some of that data uh, to different uh, services. Uh, they can send that information to uh, for storage. Uh, that storage includes a warm path and cold path store. Um, that information can go to visualization tools and uh, part of that information that is stored can be used to feed machine learning models. And obviously uh, here somehow is mentioned the user management, but notice that uh, the user is not uh, as present as some of the other architectures I'm gonna uh, talk or discuss later. Uh, interesting uh, because Microsoft business is a global business and obviously uh, the, it's more intended for enterprises and things like that. 
you see that there is a strong focus on a high availability and disaster recovery. Uh, obviously, deployment, make sure these things can run everywhere. And there is a strong focus on security as well. Again, we see that uh, this can be the first, uh, the, the bottom part of the diagram can be grouped into things, insights, and actions. Uh, in terms of Amazon, we see uh, two big components, the things on the cloud. Um, one of the interesting parts about uh, Amazon architecture is the inclusion of what they call device shadow. Uh, in other uh, companies or in a different literature, this is also called the, uh, uh, digital twins. Um, and basically the idea is that you can communicate uh, with your devices in the field using um, a JSON file, basically, it's basically a text file, you can imagine that, where uh, the, the sensor reports the measurement. So if at some point the communication uh, gets broken, uh, the other services can request the latest measurement from that file. And uh, if you have an actuator in, uh, in the field, then you can basically send the command uh, through that uh, device shadow. And when the uh, communication is online, that information flows to the actuator, the actuator performs the action and then updates the state back into that file. So that's a, a pretty convenient way of handling uh, the communication in cases where uh, you, don't, you are not very sure about the quality of the uh, communication. All right, uh, in terms of the architecture proposed uh, by Google, we see some common components. The cloud IoT core is similar to the IoT hub in Microsoft architecture. Again, you have a bunch of uh, services for doing the messaging. In this case, uh, publish and subscribers. Uh, you can have uh, functions for doing a very rapid uh, processing. Uh, in Amazon Web Services, those are called Lambda functions. Here, they're called Cloud functions. Uh, the storage you have, you see here, a Cloud Big Table, a BigQuery, and so on and so forth. But the interesting part, I think, about uh, Google's architecture is a strong focus on machine learning, on data-driven analytics. And I recognize that uh, that part can be done at different levels. So you can do it at the edge. Uh, you see they have TensorFlow Lite on the left, things like that. And they also recognize that they need to cope with different uh, kinds of processing units. You know, central uh, processors based on standard CPUs, uh, graphical processing units, and eventually tensor processing units. Uh, the architecture for uh, from IBM has different layers. Uh, it has a proximity network, public network, the public provider cloud, and uh, the enterprise network. But perhaps the most uh, interesting part for us was the fact that they included a specific user layer. And that's something we um, acknowledge and uh, we try to um, include in our design. All right, so uh, we went through a couple of open source initiatives uh, out there. And uh, for this presentation, I selected two. Uh, I like this one from Eclipse because it's very um, uh, oriented to uh, the hardware. Uh, so basically what we are seeing there is the software stack at three different levels. Uh, the software stack for constrained devices, for gateways, and also for uh, basically the cloud. They all have at the very bottom uh, some sort of operating system. Uh, in the case of constrained devices and perhaps some of the gateways, uh, it might be a real-time operating system. Uh, in the case of the constrained devices on top of the OS, they have a hardware abstraction layer, and that part is what allows um, the designer or the developer to interact or to access uh, the peripherals from the, from the microcontrollers or the single board computers or things like that. Uh, on top of that, you have all the software that allows the field protocols and the IoT protocols, and obviously uh, there is some uh, agent for remote management. And that's common as well for the gateway. Uh, notice that in the gateway, you have something called the application runtime. This can be uh, understood as, uh, for instance, a Java runtime environment or something like that, uh, on top of which you have a bunch of applications for doing the IoT processing and handling the protocols and all of that. Again, when you are looking at the cloud, you have either the OS and you have some sort of platform as a service um, support that allows you to uh, cope with the basic services that you need to provide. Basically the device registry, device management, uh, the event management and analytics and uh, all of that. And obviously handling the communication, the connectivity and the message routing. 
The other project uh, that I found quite interesting was uh, from Mainflux. Uh, they focus particularly on the cloud. And uh, what we see here is basically what I just showed you from Eclipse. So that means that there are many companies out there that have recognized the value of that uh, software stack within the architecture. All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the alternatives from research groups. There are uh, different architectures out there. Uh, we performed a review in 2017. We uh, went through over 600 papers trying to capture what uh, people were uh, doing uh, with IoT for agriculture and environmental applications. And we came up with this uh, architecture. So it has four layers, a physical layer, a communication layer, a service layer, and an application layer. The physical layer basically handles the sensing and the control. The communication layer uh, is basically uh, the layer that handles all the information and tries to uh, put that into uh, the cloud. And then once that, once that information is in the cloud, uh, basically you have uh, services like storage, analytics, visualization, and obviously security. In terms of applications, uh, what we did in that paper was trying to cluster uh, the applications that we saw into as many, as few categories as possible. And uh, we found that perhaps monitoring, control, prediction, and logistics could be a good approach uh, for summarizing the wide variety of applications that are found in agriculture. Uh, in a different approach, um, Good et al. in 2019 proposed an archi the architecture shown um, on the left. Uh, again, this is a bit of, uh, it, it puts a lot of um, light on the hardware side. So you see devices, gateways, it's recognized that there, there needs to be an integration middleware and also uh, the top of the layer is the application. Uh, they recognize that the device needs some uh, drivers to interact with uh, sensors and actuators. And uh, we kind of like this architecture, it's very simple, but it captures, at least from the hardware perspective, the most uh, relevant components. Also, they did a great job in mapping this architecture into other existing uh, IoT uh, architectures out there. Uh, the third uh, architecture that I want to present today from the review that we did it comes from uh, FarmBits. This is a, a paper that was published in 2017. And the interesting part here is that they do uh, similar things to what uh, CIAD and CGR centers are trying to do, basically trying to fuse uh, information from different uh, sources at uh, different spatial resolutions to get an updated spatial temporal representation of the crop. How do they do that? Basically, they have an IoT-based station that handles different sensors, soil sensors and uh, cameras fixed and uh, from cameras from drones. And that information flows uh, through a TV white space a channel to a gateway uh, close to the farm. And that gateway uh, is, is very autonomous. Basically, it doesn't need a permanent connection with the cloud. It can be, it is able to perform a lot of uh, the local computing. It computes the precision maps. It fuses the different images into panoramas. It is able to, co to coordinate the drone flight and all of that. And based on that information, it provides uh, some agricultural services for precision aggregation, uh, yield prediction, and so on and so forth. Uh, that information is stored. Um, that information is uh, sent to the cloud when the connectivity is available. And uh, they, are also, they also provide an application uh, for, for the farmer. So what's our proposal? Well, we try to take the best of what we saw out there. And uh, well, I want to start from the top this time. We want to acknowledge that the users uh, should be our um, biggest, should have our biggest uh, priority. Um, the, from the bottom, we see the device layer, uh, the communication and connectivity layer, the IoT middleware layer, and the service layer, and finally the application layer. We have three transversal layers, the developer layer, the ontology layer, and the data integrity and security layer. Okay, so once we had this reference architecture, we went um, and uh, browsed for different alternatives uh, in terms of software. 
could support um, those layers. So I'm gonna uh, show you in the next couple of slides what we found. For the device layer, uh, you can think we're gonna be dealing with microcontrollers and very uh, low power, low computing units. Um, those devices are gonna interact with the sensors and actuators. So basically you need to be able to control them or to communicate with them through different interfaces, through uh, things like uh, SPI, I2C, UART, a different bunch of protocols. Uh, you also need to be able to perform the configuration, to be able to report the status, to be able to uh, organize a message, handle the protocols, uh, handle the communication, the networking, be able to update uh, the firmware online or, uh, or the air, uh, perform uh, perhaps not only the sense of reading, but maybe a little bit of the data processing to uh, you know, be able to uh, change counts into a, a physical measurement and things like that. So there are different ways of approaching that problem. You know, you can uh, do it uh, in something like C, C language, uh, in Arduino for small projects. Uh, nowadays, there are other alternatives for Python, like MicroPython and uh, CircuitPython. But for the kind of projects that we have in mind with C, it is more likely that we need to uh, uh, use a real-time operating system. And uh, in that case, there are many options out there. There is Sapphire, uh, FreeRTOS, uh, Amazon, FreeRTOS. Uh, we have Riot, Contiki. Contiki. And for some specific uh, manufacturers like ARM, if the device is ARM Embed, then you have the ARM Embed OS. So there are many different options. The idea here is that uh, the, 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 the OS provides like a common platform over which you can develop your code. Uh, usually that code can be developed in C, but there are a few other languages. Now for the communication and connectivity layer, we, we, we need to think that there are a couple of elements between those microcontrollers and the data center itself. You know, they can, can include things like repeaters, modems, routers, gateways, and things like that. In that case, um, those systems operate under, uh, usually under a Linux operating system, a very lean version. And those versions can be created with projects like Jocto, OpenWRT, or BuildRoot. Otherwise, you can use existing uh, Linux uh, distributions. Um, there are a couple shown there on the screen. And then once you have solved that like base problem, you can uh, use open source project like Cura uh, to handle most of the needs uh, of, of the gateways. Uh, you can do some processing there or coordinate some of the processing. And for things like that, you have a Node-RED, Flogo, a stream sets, and a few others. Once you go to the data center, uh, the problem is a bit different, uh, but you know, that's pretty standard problem nowadays. So there are uh, standard operating systems for that, uh, Debian, Red Hat, Fedora, and so on and so forth. All right, so this is, um, in my opinion, the most interesting part uh, of all this work. It's about mapping uh, the services which are very IoT specific. So, First, we need to understand a little bit of the things we want to do in this layer. Uh, so we want to be able to, to have a, an IoT database that includes uh, all the assets, their properties, uh, the, uh, an IoT database that knows the network architecture, the policies and the metadata, metadata, sorry, uh, that is able to register new devices, that is able to manage those devices. You know, if a device uh, dies or has to be replaced, you have to be able to delete it. Um, uh, this layer also handles the connectivity, basically all the uh, brokers and all of that. Uh, you also need to handle uh, this layer, the persistency and concurrency, uh, the digital twins. You need to be able to uh, perform the data streaming, perhaps low level processing, perhaps service orchestration. And you would like to do this using, uh, you know, well-known or well-defined APIs, libraries, and software development kits. Now, so what's out there to support this? Uh, I see that there are at least three options for implementing these services. Uh, the, the logos that I'm showing you uh, closer to the, to the figure, to the big uh, architecture, let's say, uh, support most of these services. You know, things like Siteware, WSO2, Device Hive, uh, 
a main flux things board and the arm Pelion platform support most of these uh, services so that's one option you know but if you feel that you are too constrained for what's out there uh, then you can perhaps use projects like capua and hono and then complement what is missing with the services on the right so to give you a quick overview for device registry and management you have things like uh, lesion and wahana uh, for handling the protocols, you have things like Mosquito, Paho, Cupid, and California. For handling the persistence, the digital twins, uh, you have Dido and Borto. For messaging, you have Apache ActiveMQ and RabbitMQ. For the streaming services, there are many options, really many, many options. You have things like Kafka, FluentD, Enmaze, uh, Nifi, Minify, Sansa, Apache Fling, uh, CD. And uh, for the low-level processing and orchestration, you have things like Beam, Apache Storm, and Apache Camel. So there are quite a few options. I forgot to mention that most of these open source projects come from uh, foundations. So you have the Linux Foundation, the Apache Foundation, the Mozilla Foundation, and uh, the Cloud Computing uh, Foundation. So the next layer is about uh, the service providing services. So we, we saw that some of the common services that we need to be able to offer include storage, analytics, uh, perhaps control and visualization. Uh, in this case for storage, particularly for IoT, uh, or in general, in terms of storage, there is a huge division between uh, SQL and non-SQL databases. And uh, for IoT, we have, we're particularly interested in uh, time series databases, or at least for most of the uh, of, of, of kind of the measurements that we want to take. And there are a couple of options there. You have things like InfluxDB, OpenTSDB, Timescale, React, and so on and so forth. Uh, in terms of uh, analytics, perhaps the most, the best known platforms are Apache Spark and Hadoop. If you want to do like distributed computing and you know that you're gonna be dealing with a, a big data and uh, you can choose tools like a Spark and Leave or a Spark Graph X, Spark Streaming. If your data is not that big, then you can use uh, perhaps R or Scikit-Learn for doing that. Uh, if you want to do deep learning on top of that data, there are open source frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so on and so forth. Uh, in particular, I, I like this project called Onyx because it provides like a common framework for sharing the deep learning models uh, across all these different uh, softwares. So once you have some data and you want to perform some actions, there are platforms like uh, If This Then That. That one in particular is proprietary. However, there is an open source alternative called Hugging. And uh, the last component is the visualization. And here there are many options again. So we have the leaders of the market, which are proprietary. You know, include things like Power BI, uh, Click, uh, and uh, uh, Tableau. But also you have good open source options like uh, Grafana, Kibana, Plotly, Apache, Superset. And if you want to display um, information, maps, things like that, uh, spatial information, Carto provides an, an open source uh, option. I perhaps didn't mention uh, the bottom part, which includes how do we deploy these services, but that's important. So it's very likely or, or um, it would be ideal if we can deploy these services using uh, containers and the best uh, known platform for doing that is a Docker. And then you can handle those containers with uh, Kubernetes or nowadays using something like Knative. But there are many different options. All right, in terms of application, uh, we try to encapsulate the applications in the same way that we did it in the paper in 2017. Uh, basically, we considered that there is a strong focus on data-driven agronomy, and so we can cluster some of those applications within monitoring, prediction, control, and logistics. So basically, you collect the data for doing monitoring. With that data, you can create predictive models. Once you have those models, you can predict what's going to happen in the future. And with that information and new data, you can kind of uh, start thinking about doing uh, closed-loop control. And beyond that, there are a couple of applications uh, beyond the farm in logistics and things like that. All right, so in terms of the users, uh, beyond the classical user, like the farmer, the extension worker, and the researcher, we think it's very important for IoT to consider 
um, that a potential user of the architecture itself and all the IoT system can be another service, another uh, system, basically, a digital system. So uh, that's basically why, why we included that in uh, the figure on the right. Now, let's talk a little bit the transversal layers. So we have data integrity and security. This is basically to ensure that the data you are receiving is correct, is error-free, basically, and that it hasn't been altered by uh, somewhat, someone with bad intentions. So this layer includes things like doing the data checks, the encryption, authentication, authorization, directory management, and security policies. In terms of um, the ontologies, this is what ensures that we are able to make sense of the data and the information that is flowing through the IoT pipeline. Uh, we need basically a good representation, formal naming and definition of categories, properties and relationships among data, concepts and entities. And I think the W3C, the semantic web in particular, has done a fantastic job in defining things like OL2 and RDF. Um, finally, the last transversal layer includes the developer layer. And uh, with this layer, what we want to highlight is the importance of adopting good uh, software engineering practices from the very beginning. Uh, if we want this uh, architecture to be flexible, scalable, and so on and so forth, we need to make sure that we are able to develop good application programming interfaces, libraries, and software development kits. And also that we can uh, adopt uh, tools that have been used for years in the software development industry, such as Git, GitHub, uh, open project and things like that to keep track of, of, of the progress. All right, so we discussed what was out there, our proposal and some of the software components to support that architecture. So what about the hardware? So a very, uh, I mean, when we talk about IoT, the first thing we comes to our mind is probably the, the communication. So what sort of communication technologies are out there? And in order to, uh, kind of understand the limitations and uh, the possibilities. Uh, I think this graph is it's a, a, a great summary. So it shows the bandwidth required and the range capability, uh, the other axis. And we see that if, if you need a lot of bandwidth, you're basically limited to, I mean, at least for wireless, you're limited to mobile technologies and uh, some variants of Wi-Fi. If you don't need that much wireless, then you have perhaps other options like uh, SIGV, and perhaps you can go uh, with satellite communication. And if you don't need that much uh, bandwidth, then you can go uh, for things like a Bluetooth, um, things like uh, low power, long range wireless communications like LoRa, Sigfox, and so on and so forth. Notice that in terms of the longest range, you basically have satellite and LP1 technologies, all right? So this is important to keep in mind. Uh, the good news is that there are many devices out there that support uh, quite a few of those protocols. So the uh, device that I'm showing you on the top left, it's a device called PyCom 5Pi, and it supports Sigfox, LoRa, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, low energy, cellular LTE, uh, CAT M1, and narrowband IoT. And the price is around, you know, $75. Depending on the characteristics, those prices fluctuate a little bit. Uh, but to give you an idea of a device that uh, supports LoRa only can cost about $10 or even less in, in bulk. Um, similarly, if we go for a processing unit that doesn't have any radios, we are talking around you know, less than $2. So what I want to highlight here is that the processing units are not the expensive part of the IoT solution. As we're going to see later, the expensive part comes from the sensors. In terms of the gateways, uh, gateways are not that expensive, really. Uh, for instance, a single LoRa gateway can handle up to 2,000 devices easily uh, with 16 channels, so you can ensure a good uh, reception. Uh, we are talking uh, about prices between you know, $600 and well, over $1,000. So, uh, how do we configure those devices? How do we um, set up those devices in our uh, architecture? Well, basically depending on uh, the topology that we choose for our deployment. So in the case of the SEATS pilot, uh, perhaps LoRa is the best option. And in that case, the nodes can transmit uh, 
through a, a LoRaWAN network directly to a LoRa gateway, and then that gateway can be connected to the uh, CS infrastructure through Ethernet. But one of the things that we uh, uh, recognized from the very beginning with the interviews uh, with um, people from CIAT is that they want to try different architectures that they can provide better advice for farmers and other researchers. So they want to test different IoT technologies. And uh, in, for doing so, we try to abstract different scenarios that might be representative of uh, what could be uh, found uh, elsewhere. So imagine a second scenario where uh, those end devices communicate uh, through SIGFOX or cellular or even satellite communication. Uh, they send that information to the cloud and that information is then uh, downloaded from the farm or from a different uh, data center. A third uh, configuration will be uh, those devices sending information through a local gateway and that gateway has a backhaul to transmit information to the cloud and then back to the, to the farm or to the data center. And finally, a third uh, um, kind of configuration will include scenarios where you have two gateways and uh, those two gateways communicate, for instance, using a TV white space, you know, and those cases where because of the uh, bandwidth or the requirements in terms of sort of the constraints in terms of uh, the prices and all of that don't allow you to, to use satellite, perhaps this could be, you know, an option. So the other component in terms of hardware comes from the sensors. So here uh, I've tried to summarize the sensors that we are recommending uh, based on the requirements that we obtained from, uh, from SEAT researchers. Uh, we try to um, prefer those uh, solutions that had integrated components or integrated uh, sensors into a single unit. Uh, there are some variables that don't match exactly the requirements. And in those cases, we have put some star keys to, to highlight that. In general, you can see that, uh, you know, the, the sensors are, are expensive. Not so much the above ground sensors because, you know, you only need one per crop. But when you think about things like soil moisture, soil water potential and all of that, you need a few of them at different depths. So the prices are representative, you know, are, are important. Now, what we haven't discussed so far is how do we determine how many units or how many sensors do we need? And for that, we need to take into account the spatial sampling. Uh, for that, I've uh, summarized two approaches. The first, the first one, uh, well, before that, let's assume we have a terrain, right? A regular terrain, imagine a rectangular terrain. And we divide that terrain into tiny square cells. And the side of each uh, square is the sampling, uh, the spatial sampling that we want. In our case, three meters, for instance. So if you sample the corner, the corners of that cell, um, and you have a terrain that has, you know, nine of those cells in different configurations, you can end up with anything between 16 sensors all the way up to 28 sensors. That's the most rigorous way of doing it. You know, you can ensure that between those, those uh, between adjacent uh, um, points on the ground, you have, you are ensuring that you are respecting the sampling period, the spatial sampling period. Uh, but, you know, if, if you're flexible, a little bit flexible, perhaps you can sample the center of the cell. And in that case, you see that in very different configurations, you can, you can go away with only nine sensors. Now, there is a problem that might not be entirely uh, clear the first time. But depending on the configuration, on the spatial configuration of the terrain, you might get some degenerate cases. Things like the one I'm showing you on the right, where the terrain is in kind of diagonal and the distance between the centers is uh, larger than the desired spatial sampling period. You can think that there is like a tiny triangle there, apply the Pythagoras theorem, and then you'll find out that this, the actual spatial sampling there will be like 1.4 times what you want it. So, but you know, that's not really a problem if you can ensure that you have a, a very dense terrain, which I think is pretty uh, much the case in uh, most of the scenarios. All right, so how do we determine the number of sensors that we need? Basically, that depends on the number of terrains we have, on the size of each terrain, basically the width and the length, it depends on the number of some of, of the vertical samples that we need to take, 
depends on the number of variables as well. So basically, um, all these variables go against us in terms of the numbers that we need. Uh, in particular, the spatial sampling period, uh, the, the smallest the value, the larger the number of sensors that we need. So to give you a quick idea of what I'm talking about, I have uh, summarized some results in these two tables. So the table on the top shows the total number of required sensors when we're sampling the corners of the cells that I explained before. So when we are sampling uh, every three meters, we need about 2,224 sensors. Um, if we sample every six meters, then that number goes down to 716 sensors. Um, when we sample the centers at three meters, we need 1,678 sensors. And when we sample every six meters uh, while well, sampling the centers of the cells, we only need 430 sensors. So, you know, we're talking about big numbers here, and th this is very important. All right, so what about the number of end nodes that we need? Uh, so, to kind of uh, dimension that number, we made an assumption, and is that it might be feasible to uh, uh, communicate with the different sensors uh, for a single point in the space using one uh, end node. Under that assumption, uh, if you sample the corners at three meters, we're talking about 172 sensors. And uh, if you sample the centers, we're talking about 130 sensors. You know? Notice that in uh, those scenarios, with a single LoRa gateway, you can cover both of those IoT um, deployments. So the gateway, again, is not a problem. It's not, uh, it doesn't make a huge impact in the overall, um, in the overall numbers. Now let's talk a little bit about the costing. So for the costing, uh, we focus on things like the sensors, the end nodes, and the gateways, and uh, some, co uh, some very rough estimate of the taxes and shipping fees. We didn't include in the estimation uh, and other hard hardware costs like mechanical enclosures, solar panels, batteries, cables, poles, um, the development costs, you know, the, the design and uh, the signal conditioning circuits, printed circuit boards, the design uh, of, of the PCB, the manufacturing, the assembling, testing, uh, the software development cost, firmware, and all of that. Uh, we didn't consider the maintenance and we didn't consider uh, network fix and things like that, you know, because those are very uh, implementation specific. Um, so, as you can imagine, there are many different options, many different sensors, many different end nodes, uh, a few gateways. So, instead of providing many different alternatives, we opted for creating like two scenarios, uh, like a very basic one and uh, the most expensive one. Uh, so on the left, you see the most expensive alternatives, basically the coasting using high end components and sampling the corners, right? And on the right, you see the coasting with low end components and sampling the center. So you might be thinking, okay, why, what does he mean by high-end components and low-end components? Remember when I show you uh, the end node alternatives, there are some nodes that can uh, handle up to five different communication technologies. So I use that for the table on the left, and for the table on the right, I use the end nodes that can only handle LoRa. For the left, I use the most expensive gateway, and for the right, I use the least expensive gateway. And remember, the left uses samples, the court samples, uh, for the left, I sample the corners, and for the right, I sample the centers. So to give you a quick overview, if we sample at three meters uh, for the table on the left, the price is about anything, it's around 750 grand, uh, whereas for the right alternative, it's about 550 grand. If we sample at six meters, uh, and we see the table on the left, that value goes down to 245 grand. And if we go to the table on the right, we're talking about 145 grand. In these tables, I assume about a 30% overhead for taxes and shipping fees and all of that, which applies for Colombia at least. Um, but obviously, that, this is a very uh, country specific. All right, so uh, let's continue with some thoughts about framing the IoT reference architecture within the PAN-CGIR information architecture. 
Um, one of the things we want to be able to do is to fuse information uh, from different spatial resolutions, from different sources like drone, satellite imagery, and field sensors um, within this, this framework. And the, 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 the main uh, conclusion that we got was that it is important to get georeference and timestamp measurements. If we have that, it's very, well, it, it is, it's manageable to perform the fusing at the service layer or at the application layer. Now, how do we ensure um, that we can scale the solution? At least in terms of hardware, uh, we need to make sure that we have you know, the appropriate infrastructure, like uh, good servers uh, with uh, good RAM and all of that. But also in terms of software, we need to be able to deploy containerized solutions. And that means using you know, a combination of Dockers and perhaps Kubernetes or something like that. Now, how do we share these services once they are online? Uh, I think the best way of doing it is using APIs. And uh, for that, we need to provide some endpoints and the appropriate authorizations. And uh, in terms of security, how do we protect the sensitive data? I think it's important to handle this field at least in two different ways. One, through cybersecurity, and the second one, through anonymization. Because it's very likely that some uh, information uh, can be leaked through uh, the dashboards and reports. So we need to be careful uh, in the way we present the information, not only in the way we transmit the information, but also in the way we present it. Okay, so uh, let me uh, conclude. Um, what we found is that most of the IoT architectures from technology leaders focus on large businesses, large enterprises. Um, most of them assume that the information is already on the cloud which is not necessarily the case for, for agriculture. Actually, in agriculture, I think that's the, the, the most difficult part, you know, bringing that information from the field to the, to the, to the data center in a reliable way, uh, because the conditions are pretty harsh. Uh, we noticed that most of the open source architectures provide a guide for the required components. Um, the only problem is that when you are facing the, the dilemma of, of doing it yourself, the entry bar can be quite high, particularly for non-technical people. Um, in terms of what we saw from the researchers, we discovered that there are a couple of uh, key challenges that they address, um, but we can infer like a very good high level overview of, of, of what's needed uh, in that field. Um, so basically we try to adopt the best practices of each community and uh, we develop or we propose an architecture that has the user as a top priority, which is flexible and can be adapted and scale, has, um, uh, has the security as one of the transversal components and uses ontologies um, and expose resources and services through APIs so that it can be integrated uh, or we think it can, uh, into a larger pan-CGIR information architecture. Um, we noticed that the spatial sampling strategy, the spatial sampling period, and the vertical number of samples have a strong impact on the number of sensors and node and the overall cost of the solution. We think that it's possible um, to find a better match between the requirements and the commercial offerings. For instance, um, some of the variables uh, in the requirements had to be sampled at 10, 30, 40, and 60 centimeters. But there are commercial offers, offerings out there to provide some of those samplings at three different depths, uh, 15 centimeters, 45 centimeters, and 91 centimeters. So if somehow it's possible to match that, uh, they'll bring like a, a huge, uh, uh, you know, the kind of discount in, in the world price. Uh, in terms of RF compatibility, um, currently the drones and onboard equipment at SEAT use wireless links at 900 megahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, 5.8 gigahertz. And uh, there are some troublesome frequencies with the radio, radio technologies. Uh, so for instance, 915 megahertz for LoRa, 920 megahertz for Sigfox, 2.4 gigahertz for Bluetooth low energy and Wi-Fi, and also 5.8 gigahertz for some Wi-Fi technologies as well. So I would recommend, you know, to test um, some of these radio technologies with the drones on the ground at different points around the crops and make sure that everything is working all right before uh, taking off.
Uh, beyond this presentation, there is additional information available on a set of written reports. Uh, if you're interested, please ask uh, Brian from SEAT. And uh, thinking about ideas for the future, I think it will be really uh, useful as a community to develop a set of user guides for configuring and linking different uh, open source IoT platforms, libraries, and services, particularly for non-technical people. Also, um, it makes sense to develop perhaps even a smaller pilot with different te uh, to test different uh, communication technologies uh, you know, in the field uh, to actually provide more tailored recommendations for the ACK community. Uh, I think it's very important to try to maximize the spatial sampling period for each trait because as we saw before, it has a strong impact on the numbers of, of units that we, we need. And finally, uh, given the number of sensors, the number of sampling points and all of that, we think it's uh, important to uh, consider or uh, somehow create perhaps a challenge, I don't know, for developing an IoT sensor probe for agriculture. Um, that will simplify the field deployment quite a lot. And uh, that sensing probe could include transducer for soil temperature, soil moisture, water potential, and ideally, MPK, a different depth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Haido, for sharing your work. It's very interesting. In fact, we have uh, many questions coming up. So why don't we start? So Sunu Kim asks, um, what is the advantage of developing our own using open source technology versus off the self integrated solutions like Arable? Um, I think it depends on, 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 on your use case. Uh, if you're a business, uh, I don't know, but I think for farmers, it's important to keep the solutions uh, very open and uh, that can be ensured with solutions coming from uh, these open source foundations. Uh, they're reliable, um, you know what to expect uh, from the very beginning, uh, you know what the costs are gonna be, and then basically, you know, uh, they give you access to options that are beyond what's available in a kind of uh, proprietary solutions. Nice, perfect. So next question is from Joanna Hurtado. Are you thinking to use blockchain for data security and traceability? Uh, that could be an option, yeah. I mean, perhaps when you, what we're talking about logistics, the application, uh, that could be an option, you know, it's uh, been used before then, uh, yeah, that, that could be an, an option. Uh, I don't know if I'll use that for every component, but definitely for some uh, logistics, uh, yeah, it could be used for sure. Perfect. And Joanna has another question, which um, I think you already answered, but um, if you would like to repeat the, the answer to that, how much was the cost of the development of all the platform? Do you have cost for the operation? Uh, no, as I mentioned, basically what we did in the costing was to focus on uh, the hardware because we assumed that you know, the software uh, would come from open source projects. So yeah, the implementation details uh, are not yet there because you know uh, they'll require like a contractor or someone or something like that coming into it. So yeah, we don't have that estimate at this point. Okay, perfect. Um, Elizabeth Arnott asks, thanks Haido, do you think that existing public ontologies are sufficient to provide all concepts needed for data annotations? If not, what is missing? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on ontologies, but uh, I think there is a lot of uh, development for the semantic web. Um, I think there is enough to get started. I'm sure there are very, uh, there are a few things that are very uh, agriculture specific. Um, but I think, you know, it provides a good starting point, basically. Um, yeah, it's basically a general framework, you know, it's like, a, for instance, the old two, it's a language. You can do mm -hmm. lots of things with a language, you know, it's like, a, a, think about a programming language. You can do pretty much anything you want with it. Uh, how many
libraries are there for what you need? Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, it, it really depends on the use case. Great. Um, we have another question from Manu Magombi. She asks, I see these instruments are relatively expensive and how do you see their ap applicability in developing countries? Uh, yeah, I think that's um, the key question, to be honest. Uh, we need to find a way to lower the cost for the sensors. Otherwise, I mean, uh, I think beyond research, it would be hard to widespread this technology. Uh, because in agriculture, we need uh, lots of sensors. And um, right now, they're the most expensive component of the IoT architecture. So yeah, I think we should perhaps push forward the idea of developing, you know, the same way we are developing open source software projects, we should be pushing forward open source hardware projects for agriculture. Mm -hmm. Great. Next question from Abhishek Rathor. I, is there any undertaken to see accuracy of sensors? Um, they said that they have tested a few for temperature and two of them kept at the same point were differing by one degree Celsius. So I think if you have any study that has proven accuracy of your sensors, I think that's the main question. Uh, so basically what we did for specifying the sensors, we went to the requirements. Uh, let me go through that slide. So we this uh, table as an input. And then we went uh, out to the market, uh, trying to find uh, sensors that could meet these specs, you know? Uh, so Michael provided us with uh, some of the minimum specs that, they, uh, that he was, you know, aiming for. And then we went through the data sheets of uh, the sensors that we proposed. And we tried to find a good balance uh, as I mentioned before, some of those sensors don't exactly meet the requirement, like the air temperature and the total solar radiation that I propose here. But, you know, if the accuracy is really, really required for these two sensors, then here I'm proposing uh, two options. But there are many options. I mean, you can check uh, the, the way the, the, the manufacturers ensure the um, uh, specs. But I think, at least in my case, I took for granted that what was uh, in the data sheet uh, was the real thing. Uh, obviously, it will require some uh, validation, particularly uh, some of these sensors might behave differently over time, um, but that's part of the experiment. Also, some of them are very, uh, particularly the, the soil moisture, soil water potential, soil temperature, they're actually intended for agricultural applications. So I think they're pretty robust, but still, you know, from time to time, you need to perform some calibration and uh, some maintenance. Some of them might get broken. Um, so actually part of the IoT architecture includes a block called um, data checks that ensures that continuously you are monitoring the measurements. You know, if you're, if you're reading temperature and uh, you are underground and all of a sudden you get, you know, 100 degree measurement, uh, that might be, you know, off, <laughs> perhaps the sensor is dying or it's already dead for sure. So uh, you need to uh, kind of build in some intelligence into the architecture to detect those outliers. But yeah, basically what, what I did was uh, going through the specs uh, from the data sheets and selecting the closest match to the requirement we got. Great, thanks. We have a question from Meta. And um, you mentioned ontologies as a data harmonization standard. Have you used the IoT light ontology? I am not familiar with it, but it seems to have a quantity kind, for example, temperature class. I'm curious as to if how well such an IoT ontology plays with existing ontologies that describe agronomic measurement parameters. Uh, yeah, there are some uh, specific um, solutions out there, but I try to avoid those, to be honest, uh, because the ontology problem is a fairly general problem. So again, I mean, you can, you can fall in love for a very specific library, or you can uh, uh, see the power of a strong language, you know? Uh, I, I went for the second one here. 
but yeah, there are some alternatives that are very uh, specific. Uh, no, I, I didn't explore beyond that, to be honest. But you know, the, also part of the reason was also that uh, CIAD has a good a community of practice uh, with ontologies. So I'm sure they have uh, already selected good alternatives for that. I just basically wanted to frame uh, that components within a larger uh, uh, view, you know, you, here you need to deal with agriculture, but you need to deal with hardware and you need to deal with software. So you need to make sure that the solution you pick will allow you to move through these different fields easily. Great, thanks Heido. And two more questions. The last final questions are from Marco von Denberg. Have you considered using upcoming internet connectivity options such as Starlink, SpaceX? Uh, yes, that would be fantastic. I mean, and also, you know, once the 5G is everywhere, we could definitely jump in. Uh, what we tried to, to do here was to uh, see some of the existing options and uh, evaluate them based on that. But yeah, there are many promising technologies uh, coming through and I uh, would recommend CGIR centers to do an exercise similar to this one at least every year because the hardware and the software is changing so quickly that, you know, perhaps this presentation is gonna be irrelevant in two years, so. Mm -hmm. So I think that's about it. Um, haven't received actually more questions. I thought there was another question up here, but I think that's about it. But um, to wrap up, Hiro, um, I think you have it, your email in the last present in the last slide so if anyone wants to ask more questions to Heido um, you can do so by in his email which is shown in his last slide um, and well yeah that's about it thank you everyone for joining the webinar remember that the link to the recording will be shared through social media channels such as Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and the web page of the CGIR platform for Big Data and Agriculture. Oh, and also remember to check our YouTube channel for the recording. So thank you, Heido and Brian. One last Brian. thing. <laughs> one last, uh, one, also one other thing. Uh, so uh, Heido mentioned that uh, the reports uh, are available. Um, so feel free to reach out to me directly. And um, the, uh, the knowledge management folks are um, in the process of putting everything up in CG space. Um, there are, uh, each of those major sections of what Hyro spoke to has, a, has its own unique report. Um, there are also some Excel-based and Python-based tools for figuring out your, your um, figuring out and costing out your sampling, basically, making some decisions on sampling, and then evaluating those in terms of costs. And so, um, anyway, that'll be up in CG space sometime soon, hopefully. I requested it about a week ago. Um, so, yeah, and feel free to reach out to me directly if you'd like to take a look at those reports sooner. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, everyone. See ya. Bye.